bit of introduction here. Um, you know, my name is Ian Davidson, and I'm the Chief Business Development Officer at Seger International. Um, on behalf of our whole team, we want to extend our thanks to each of you for joining us today, and also thanks to each of our members of our expert panel for them participating as well. Um, if you're not familiar with Segra, <clears throat> we're an agriculture technology company based up in Vancouver, Canada, um, specializing in cannabis plant tissue culture, genetic banking, young plant production, genomics, molecular biology, and plant pathogen detection. And our primary focus is on the development, distribution, and preservation of clean stock cannabis cultivars for licensed producers globally. If you have interest in our service or services or follow-up question after today's event, <clears throat> uh, you can reach out to us directly by emailing our team at info at segra-intl.com. And we'll bring that uh, email up at the, again at the end of the pres presentation. Um, so today's talk is part of our ongoing Segra Growth Talks webinar series, where we focus on providing a platform to explore science-based discussions related to cannabis in collaboration with top industry experts. Um, past growth talks can be viewed on our website, and we also have a number of additional growth talks in the pipeline, so please stay tuned for further event announcements. Um, today's discussion will focus on the very timely topic of viruses and viroids in cannabis, what you need to know in 2022. Why is this topic so timely? Well, as commercial cannabis production grows globally, cannabis pathogen management challenges are also growing. Uh, for decades, the isolated nature of cannabis operations helped to slow the process of cannabis pathogen spread and evolution. Legacy growers have been dealing with bacterial and fungal pathogens for decades that can be treated with commercial pesticides and basic on-farm cultural practices. However, the occurrence of viruses and viroids in cannabis has only become a legitimate production concern in recent years, and many growers have yet to implement programs to address the associated risks. We now find ourselves, our industry at a critical juncture where every cannabis operator must develop systems to manage the challenges of plant viruses and viroids. And this is no easy task as the scientific understanding regarding this topic is in its infancy, including the need to tackle key questions like how to effectively detect them, which ones actually cause economic damage to cannabis crops and what preventive practices are best. We have a lot to learn in the coming years. And this event today represents our attempt at Segra to support the open conversation and information dissemination related to the topic. So in today's event, we'll kick it off with Segra's own Dr. Oliver Korea, sharing a brief presentation, followed by a roundtable discussion with our expert panel. Uh, we'll then move into a question and answer session uh, where the panel will field follow-up questions from the audience. And please use the question and answer feature on Zoom here to submit any of your questions and we'll do our best to address them. Um, with the wide breadth of knowledge and diverse range of academic and commercial experience amongst the panelists, we should have, uh, we should be in very good hands today for a lively conversation. And uh, then without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Karina. Uh, thanks a lot, Ian. I have been interested in plants and plant biotechnology for a long time since uh, my undergrad at uh, the University of Western Ontario. Um, that drew me to start a PhD down at Washington State University, where I studied specialized plant metabolism and particularly uh, phenylpropanoids and led me directly really to the cannabis, uh, cannabis industry uh, due to my interest in terpene and phenylpropanoid metabolism. I've been working in the industry since 2018 and joined Segra in the fall as uh, director of applied genomics. And I'll be uh, running programs that involve uh, genetics and genomics here at Segra. And I'll just pass it over to John next, I think, to introduce himself. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is uh, Dr. John Brenstein here. I've been associated with Segra for about uh, eight years now. My background is a PhD in biochemistry um, with about 20 to 25 years experience, primarily in the uh, detection uh, of viruses and uh, microbial pathogens uh, originally in, in clinical settings and then uh, obviously in my time here at Segra in that context and also uh, in, in developing uh, genotyping methods for rapid means of identifying uh, cannabis varieties. So uh, hopefully uh, a little bit of a virology background uh, may be of, of relevance and, uh, and use here. 
and I'll pass it back to Oliver uh, for uh, introduction of the uh, the next panelist. Joseph, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure. Hi. Um, my name is Joseph Ramahi, PhD. Um, I am a Californian scientist from the Bay Area um, who uh, I, as an academic researcher, I got my PhD at UC Davis in plant molecular biology, chromosome engineering. Um, I had um, a few postdocs in uh, clinical settings, cancer research before I ended up back in plant science in 2016. Um, since then, I've been in the cannabis tissue culture and um, mo uh, molecular diagnostics field, uh, doing um, work at companies such as like Dark Heart Nursery, developing their tissue culture and working on their tissue culture and Maristem cleanup program, and several other hemp and cannabis companies in the state of California since then, working on lab development, tissue, uh, cannabis tissue culture, hemp tissue culture, and pathogen indexing and pathogen remediation. So uh, maybe I'll go next. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Smaz Bayat. I did my PhD in the plant in the area of plant tissue culture from um, England, United Kingdom. I came to North America uh, as an academic and um, converted into uh, commercial production of tissue culture. I'm working on the plant tissue culture in, uh, for the commercial production for the last 20 years. Um, I'm specialized on uh, uh, developed protocols, uh, commercialization of different crops. Um, I did almost um, 1,000 different uh, crops, uh, uh, protocol development for commercial, commercial production. I also have the specialization of cleaning plants. I did an uh, intensive work on the um, blueberry area, strawberry area to cleaning virus and the viroids from those uh, genetics last 10-15 uh, years. Um, I'm involved at SEGRA for last six years, um, published about um, 250 scientific journals and few books. I uh, have patented about five of those so far now. Um, and here I am today, we are working with SEGRA for cannabis industry. Thank you very much. So we'll have a chance to, uh, to speak with uh, the panelists after uh, a short presentation uh, that I've put together. Um, so I will jump right into that now. So the topic of today's conversation is cannabis viruses and viroids. And I'm really glad that uh, there's so much interest in this that you're able to join us today to hear more about what you need to know in 2022. So this is gonna be a brief presentation uh, about the next 15 minutes or so. So we can't cover everything you need to know, but hopefully we'll get to all of your burning questions during the discussion and Q&A after this presentation. I'll talk a little bit about uh, what viruses are known to infect cannabis. So there's a lot of viruses out there, only certain ones are actually present and can infect cannabis. Uh, what impact this has on the cannabis industry itself and what you can do to protect yourself in terms of these layers of protection prevention, testing and remediation. Uh, so first of all, like, why are viruses and viroids a concern? There's a lot of them out there, according to the Encyclopedia of Plant Viruses and Viroids. There's over 1,500 of them currently known to infect plants, and this is probably a, a vast underestimation. Of those known, they can often infect multiple plant species. Um, so when you're growing in an environment, uh, such as the one shown here, these are large open spaces. Um, a lot of the cannabis facilities have been converted over from growing other vegetables and fruits, such as strawberries, peppers, cucumbers, the like, that could be harboring viruses and could be hanging around in those, those facilities since they're not affected by agricultural pesticides, facilitating a, an easy jump over to uh, their new host, uh, cannabis. Uh, the other issue with cannabis in particular, as for um, some other important crop species, is that uh, it's propagated typically uh, via cuttings. And if you have an infected plant, that infection may or may not transfer to the cutting, depending on whether the leaf or the part of the plant that you transfer over uh, is infected in the first place. So this is just kind of a, a short list of some of the viruses and viroids that I've found solid evidence for in the literature of infecting cannabis. If you take um, that number of 1500 that I presented in the first slide, this is actually a very small, small number of viruses that have been shown to successfully infect cannabis. And it, it seems to be generally pretty resistant to virus and viroid infection. But 
Uh, there's a number that have been identified. I'm not going to go through the full list, but I wanted to point out a few things here. So first of all, the nomenclature is that the first name in the in the virus name is the uh, type of plant that was first found to be infected by that virus. A lot of these, as you can see, are different plants. Uh, there's a couple that are cannabis, but others have obviously jumped from other species. Uh, the second word in the name is uh, the symptom, so either a mosaic phenotype, cryptic, streak, chlorosis, etc., and then whether it's a virus or a viroid. And we'll, we'll get into the difference of those a little later, but you can see on the acronyms that viruses are denoted by a, a V and the viroid have the little VD there. So it's an easy way to tell the difference. The last two things I wanna show on this slide are the locations where they were identified. So this is really, they've been found all over the world from the EU to North America, Middle East. And once identified uh, and we know what to look for, they can quickly be picked up in other areas. Um, we can detect them in, in other jurisdictions. Finally, a lot of these viruses have been found in about the last decade or so as the cannabis industry really has started to open up for study, for research. I think we'll find more and more of these, um, uh, these viruses coming to light. Uh, so what's the economic impact of these specifically? So there's two ways that viruses and viroids can cause damage to the industry. First of all, causing a reduction in yield. So the Many viruses and viroids will reduce the size of the plant, they'll drain the energy. Uh, some have been known to actually decrease specialized metabolites like cannabinoids and terpenes, reducing the, the value that you can draw from those plants. And then crop full crop loss is also an issue in terms of uh, culling out of infected plants to try to stop the spread. Uh, so in between 2018 and 2021, uh, around the time that HLVD was first uh, co-discovered by Dark Heart Nurseries, uh, they surveyed um, cannabis operations in California and found that approximately 90% of them showed some signs of HLVD infection. And this was typically at a rate of about 20 to 30% positivity, which translates potentially to about a 30% loss or $4 billion of uh, the, the industry in, in, um, in California. Um, being in Canada, I also looked for some numbers up here, which weren't particularly easy to find, but uh, just looking at the market value of the legal rec market in 2021 and 2022, estimated to be about $2.6 and $4.2 billion. You can see that the level of incidence across Canada could uh, result in a sizable loss as well. So uh, this data is, was presented by Dr. Zamir Punja at the American Pathological Society last year. You can see here that of the samples coming in for testing, about 90% in 2020 were testing positive for HLVD. This was soon after the virus was discovered. And the following year, that dropped to about 25% positivity rate as growers uh, culled their infected crops and tried to start uh, started managing this issue. And viruses, uh, the data is, uh, is a little more convoluted even, but they did some studies uh, using a different test, ELISA. Uh, it's an antigen-based test uh, to search for six different uh, well-known viruses and found that uh, while the the positivity uh, rates were much lower uh, in the maxing out at about 5% here. Just note the difference in scales on these two uh, charts that I've put up. It, it is substantial. And if these trends continue, uh, the numbers are small, but the uh, rate of positivity um, could potentially be, be increasing in five of these six uh, viruses, at least. So on to prevention. What can be done at, at a local level to prevent the spread of viruses? And the answer is much the same as what you're doing to prevent the spread of other pathogens, such as uh, fungus and, and bacterial uh, pathogens, but with some particular um, specifics for viroids and viruses. So these might include things like um, monitoring plants, particularly the plants that are coming into your facility for the first time, ensuring that those um, plants are, are well tested, free of disease symptoms, careful monitoring of mothers, because these are, you know, where your cuttings come from and can easily spread any potential infection around the entire facility. Having proper SOPs for your uh, PPE, for sterilizing of equipment, and so on. It's important to control insect pests, as many uh, viruses can actually 
actually use insects as an alternate host and can be transferred from plant to plant. Just general things, so regular screening of your crops, making sure that uh, there's no signs of infections. And if you find those signs, uh, quarantine those plants or if necessary, uh, cull those sick plants. Also kind of under the prevention umbrella at a, at a larger scale, so this is called kind of industry-wide measures that can be taken, is screening for resistance in cultivars uh, through either uh, pheno hunting or large-scale breeding programs. A good example of this came from um, a group in Washington State and Oregon last year uh, where they identified a cultivar with powdery mildew resistance phenotype. And through a, a process, uh, they used genomic tools to narrow down the specific DNA variant that was responsible for this resistance phenotype. And it's now possible to go and search for that particular DNA, DNA variant, variant um, and find a plant that should be uh, resistant to powdery mildew. So this process uh, is, is for a, uh, a fungal pathogen, but the process could be repeated if virus and viroid resistant plants are identified and DNA markers could be discovered corresponding to um, those particular resistances. The other thing that goes really hand in hand with prevention is testing. So you need to be able to know that your preventative measures are working. And the way to do that is uh, to have a measurement. A measurement tool usually consists of either an antigen test or a DNA-based test. Um, and I just have this figure down at the bottom to remind people what we're looking for. So a virus has both a capsid and nucleotide genome, either composed of RNA or DNA, whereas a viroid is a naked nucleotide sequence. So um, an antigen test typically can be used for viruses, but as viroids lack that capsid cap, they typically aren't identified using these tests, whereas a DNA or RNA-based test can pick up either viruses or viroids. Quickly um, going through a couple of the options that are available they, for antigen tests, an in-house method that can be used, it's typically used, are these immunostrips. This is a quick yes or no positive negative reaction that will detect the presence or absence of virus capsid, basically. This test is not as sensitive as, as some others. And if you do get a, a positive test or something that's maybe intermediate, uh, you should send those samples for uh, laboratory testing for methods such as ELISA, which is uh, more sensitive and, and can give some semi more semi-quantitative idea of, of the amount of virus that you're dealing with. Just quickly, both of these tests rely on the same basic principle where there's a target antigen in the virus virus or viroid you're looking at. Enzymes, enzyme labeled antibodies are designed to recognize that target and a colometric or fluorometric assay is present when binding the target, it changes color and you can visualize that change. On the DNA and RNA based assay side, again, there are assays that are available for testing in-house. These can be useful um, if you want a quick yes or no answer, um, if you have a question or a concern about a particular plant. One of those methods is called loop-mediated isothermal amplification, or LAMP. This has the advantage where it doesn't need any fancy equipment. You just need a heat block that can hold it at a steady temperature, and it's going to run the reaction. There are some caveats, which I think we'll discuss a little bit more in more detail in the, in the discussion, but it's kind of a, a first pass, yes or no, that can direct your response to the issue. For more quantitative analysis, it's typically necessary to send it to a laboratory for analysis by qPCR for DNA or reverse transcriptase qPCR for RNA. And this can give a quantitative method that can detect very small amounts of the virus or viroid um, down to the picogram or even femtogram scale. If a virus or viroid happens to evade the preventative and testing measures that you've put in place, it can, it can result in basically a, a cycle of infection where the cuttings that you're taking may initially look uninfected, but uh, particularly for viruses or viroids that are latent, such as HLVD, these can come up and present symptoms uh, months and months uh, after the fact. So to avoid this cycle of infection, one method that can be used is apical meristem tissue culture. So the shoot apical meristem 
is this region at the, at the very top of the plant. It's a group of undifferentiated cells that can grow into any other um, tissue in the plant. So it can form stems and leaves, uh, roots, has all of that information contained in it. It also is typically unvascularized. So viruses and viroids travel through the vasculature of the plant, uh, through the, the xylem and the phloem. And if they can't reach that area, then it is typically means that it's, it's free of those viruses. Through a, a, a process uh, that shoot apical meristem can be removed and regenerated through a series of steps using meristematic tissue culture and regrowing into a healthy plant. It isn't quite that easy. Uh, once you have a healthy plant, uh, a series of recurrent testing is required over time to ensure that, that viruses and viroids don't come back. Again, I'm thinking about HLVD, which can have periods of latency. But over time and with repeated tests, one can be confident that cycle can be broken, that uh, healthy plants can be generated out of this process and that you can have a successfully remediated plants through tissue culture. Okay, so um, in conclusion, at Sagra, we take viruses and viroids very seriously. We have a, a group of scientists here, which are really leaders in their fields. Dr. Zabayad is um, a leader in plant tissue culture. He's developed the pri proprietary methods that we use here at Zagra. Dr. John Brunstein is a, uh, a molecular viro virologist by training and has developed all the molecular detection assays. And here at Segra, we're also very interested in, in education, outreach, and, and building a community. And uh, Dr. Joseph Ramahi is, is part of that broader community and shares our interest in, um, in education and in helping the, the industry move forward on topics such as this. At this time, I'd like to invite you to join me for a discussion and QA with um, these three esteemed scientists. And I'll look forward to having a conversation with them afterwards, hearing whatever questions that uh, the audience may have. So thank you very much. All right, thanks, Oliver. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we're gonna move now into our uh, panel discussion. Uh, why don't you go ahead, Oliver, and kick that off for us? All right, so um, yeah, jumping right into it. So off the top, uh, this is a general question that I think can just kind of start a conversation and a discussion. For each of you, what, what are the top viruses and viroids that show up on your radar? And what seems to be causing the most damage today? Uh, maybe, uh, Joseph, do you want to kick that one off? Um, sure. Um, in my experience in the California and West Coast space, also in other states, hoplate and viroid is still in a large percentage of production cannabis. Um, lots of companies and groups are getting much better at having um, kind of clean plant programs to deal with this. But there's hoplate virus, I think, is still one of the more prominent things that's in both the hemp and cannabis production space. Um, outdoor growers are dealing with things like beet curly top on the West Coast. I think there are a lot of very regional um, pathogens as far as like uh, uh, as far as um, uh, as far as like which what is where. Um, but one thing I wanted to end on is just like as far as like this Path, uh, hoplane virus specifically, like these impacts are things like crop instability, crop loss, lack of rooting and vegetative propagation, which I've seen operations lose genetics from this very often. Um, and also just kind of this asymptomatic switch where many plants can be asymptomatic and then all of a sudden a secondary stress happens and significant crop loss can happen. John, how about from your perspective, what, um, what kind of viruses and viroids do you see and which ones are you concerned about? Uh, with your background as a virologist, I'm interested kind of not only what you see now, but kind of projecting forward as well, what might be on the horizon. So for, for what I see now, you know, I really much have to sort of agree with Joseph. Uh, it's not just that hop latent viroid has uh, a well-documented prevalence, um, but it also the uh, impact on the plant is critical. It's not just that, the, that a virus or viroid is there. Uh, we care about whether, at the end of the day, does it cause does it does it cause a problem? Do, do we care about it? Let's not waste resources um, unless you know there, it's actionable. 
And certainly hop latent viroid uh, checks all of those boxes. And for biological reasons, it's, it's challenging because of its latent nature. Um, in terms of other ones, uh, I think we haven't seen much evidence of it yet. It's been noted a handful of times and it wasn't in your list there, but hop stunt viroid has been detected. Now in hops, that can be pretty serious. Um, the, the jury is really out right now, whether it has significant issues in cannabis. Um, so that's certainly one I think we need to uh, look for some more. Um, beat curly top virus, uh, Joseph mentioned there, he's mentioned it twice now. And you know, interestingly enough, uh, that's the only one on the panel, it's a DNA virus, which for technical reasons made it very easy to start testing for. And so we started testing for that one two years ago and we've looked at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of samples up here. Um, somewhat boringly, we, we haven't found a case yet. So I think that's more of an outdoor uh, thing, but you know, let's watch if somebody gets that indoors. So those are kind of the ones top of our list. Other things like lettuce chlorosis, uh, tobacco mosaic, those are all things that have been detected, but it's unclear at this point how widespread they are, or even if they, uh, if there's no significant impact on the plant, maybe it's kind of a moot point whether they're there or not. Uh, we are going to have to expect to see novel and emerging strain things here. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we're hoping to do here at Segra is this longitudinal metagenomics study. And I think um, rather than waiting to stumble across these, it'd be nice to do metagenomic screens of plants, particularly ones for our case coming through tissue culture and see, let's not guess, let's actually see what's there. And we may be surprised or we may find novel agents. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the, the question of beet curly top virus that you alluded to there came up in a similar study um, in, in Colorado with outdoor grown hemp, uh, where they used a metagenomic approach to, to identify, to screen for, for viral communities that were present. So uh, over to, to Small, if you wanted to chime in on uh, viruses and viroids on your radar. And, uh, um, sure, I can. What we are actually, my experience here, what, what we are receiving at Sagra facility. So, so far we have um, from different clients, we are receiving positive um, on hop latent. Most of the clients, our clients are worried about hop latent viruses. And 13 of those uh, we actually um, uh, received um, th this year. And late last year, 13 uh, different cultivars um, to clean those. So that's the, I, I would say that's the most important for our clients right now. Uh, recently, we are getting call for TMV to uh, presence or cleaning. So that's the only two I got in my experience in, in uh, cleanup in tissue culture facilities here at Sagra are those two. Right. So the next one's kind of, it's also a very general question and kind of the issues of studying viruses and, and how to pick apart um, asymptomatic infection versus how to distinguish that from, from maybe abiotic stress or some other phenotypes. But in the case of, of two viruses, um, disease symptoms attributed to hemp streak virus and hemp mosaic virus, which were first described in the 40s and 50s, they haven't actually been identified using molecular or uh, serological means. So there's a, a recent study that came out uh, in the case of HSV, where they found that the symptoms attributed to that virus were more closely correlated. It could be more easily explained by abiotic stress rather than a virus. It didn't seem to be showing signs of, of transferring between plants and, and so on. Given that those viruses were first described 70 and 80 years ago, why is it we're still debating them now? <laughs> and what are the challenges uh, that are present to um, actually kind of associate a, a phenotypic pathological um, phenotype versus um, causation of actual disease? Um, I mean, I, for like novel identification, virus hunting is actually kind of difficult to do certain steps to prove um or well you know it's like you know proof it's like these strong correlations between the identification of some kind of transmissible element and a phenotype and like you just said there are all of these kinds of abiotic stresses that cause things like leaf variegation curling um leaf curling um for instance like when before hop latent was identified in 2019 a lot of times people were blamed for having lighting issues or nutritional issues or heat issues. So 
identifying just like these consistently sick plants. And then nowadays it's actually a lot easier. And why these kinds of debates have been raging, I think, is that only in the last decade or 15 years have we been in a modern genomics age where DNA sequencing technology, RNA sequencing technology is as accessible as it is now. It just wasn't 20 years ago. And even 15 years ago was kind of when, in the mid 2000s was when a lot of processes like PCR, RT-PCR, biotech companies started having kits where it started happening more outside of just the academic research bench. So in that time, in like the last five years or, and then also in cannabis, it's been this issue specifically because lack of research funds for these kinds of things, lack of banking, lack, lack of kind of like, uh, economic infrastructure, because science is really expensive. Uh, also, like, it's only in the last few years has academic collaboration been kind of more friendly to the cannabis science space. So I think that is kind of like my very broad input on kind of why it's taken so long and how hard it is. Um, and but it's fascinating to see how fast it's been accelerating just as every year goes. Yeah. I, I would just quickly comment that, uh, again, this is where I think, you know, metagenomics is, as uh, Joseph touched on there, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, now $2,000 a sample or so, you can do both the full uh, DNA and RNA metagenomic screen on a suspected uh, infected plant sample and see what's there. And of course, that doesn't prove causality, mm. but plants are much easier than people to do fulfilling of Cox postulate. So, you know, the simplest way, if you, if you have a plant with uh, modeling and variegation, you know, obviously what, what looks to you to be abnormal tissue, pathological tissue. And the question is, is that a transmissible agent or not, which is at the crux of, is it a, a microorganism, virus, viroid, uh, or other microbe versus uh, some genetic or nutrient issue, is look for transmissibility. And it's pretty simple in plants. I mean, you can take uh, affected tissue, uh, grind it up, mix it with something like a fine carborundum paste and take uninfected or healthy looking tissue and, you know, get a set of just sort of lab gloves and, you know, rub it on a leaf. And that's a standard transmission process and then watch for a couple of weeks. And if you see transmissibility, you're dealing with a transmissible agent. Um, the reason we're still seeing things that were raised 70 years ago is that, you know, a lot of this is anecdotal and, uh, you know, people, we're, we're not sure. And you see something that looks like it might be a virus. You see it coming through your crop and, uh, things seem to be growing before that if something didn't change your suspicion is going to be that it's uh, it's an agent but it's not always and a lot of these things are really looking like um, variety specific nutrient requirements as well so they, they can be very easily yeah. yeah and i mean i guess that's where where something like metagenomics comes in handy as well where you're not just looking for the virus of interest you're not just looking for, you know, cucumber mosaic virus and testing for that. Let's let the science tell us the what's there. Let's, yeah, let, yeah, let's not assume anything. Let's ask what's there with open eyes. And exactly. I think unless we start doing that, we're going to be, uh, we're sticking our heads in the sand here. Yeah, yeah so uh, that's uh, John's last uh, uh, comment. This really important what I am experiencing in tissue culture, not at cannabis, previously in blueberry industry or strawberry industries like, only way you can do test, test, test. So at, at Segra, we, we go test when the plants arrive, mother plants arrive, and then progressively when they're smaller population, when we do the initiation and smaller population, we try to test as much as possible. And then even the bigger population, or did any, uh, uh, even the healthy plants, we may be asymptomatic. So we go test all the time until they send it to the clients. And it's always in vigilance. So always regularly we test it. So that's the only way you can, you can actually prevent. Uh, who knows what come uh, in between all the tissue culture is a secure process, but when, as soon as they go to the uh, stage four or, or even growing, one vector infected plants can come and uh, one vector is enough to bring the uh, germs to the, to the healthy plants, right? So testing is really important. Um, and we are lucky in our facility at uh, Sagra International, we have the facilities so we can actually parallel test in-house facility, which when the top is coming next, but it is um, important to test plants when you're propagating, while you're propagating symptomatic or asymptomatic. We should continuously test and find out before going for mass propagation. Okay, so moving on to kind of impacts on the cannabis industry. 
uh, as a whole. As, as things have moved along in the last five, six years or so, as um, more and more countries have, have legalized cannabis uh, for rec or medicinal use, the cannabis industry becomes much more interconnected and, and worldwide in many ways. In the case of uh, HLVD, again, uh, once it was identified as a causal agent of the symptoms seen in facilities in California, it was later able to be detected almost, almost everywhere. Um, so it was already present in these other areas. And once we knew what to look for, uh, it, was, it was quickly found. First of all, it's kind of a two part. So first of all, are you aware of any geographic regions where HLVD is absent? And conversely, are you aware of any emerging viruses or viroids that seem to be contained to a particular geographic area? I think Joseph already kind of spoke to that a little bit, particularly with beet curly top, at least the mm-hmm. second one. So originally spotted in Colorado and from putting words in his mouth here, but uh, you know, West Coast US, he says he's spotting it. We're not seeing it here yet, but we're only looking at indoor. So that would be an emerging one, certainly in some geographies. I'm trying to think of a place where there's no hop latent viroid. And it is kind of, that's the scary thing about like, once it became publicized and people went looking, they found it everywhere. And what's the next time that's going to happen? So over to, uh, to preventing infection from a grower's perspective, and this could this could apply to large and small grow operations. But what is the what's the best way to interpret a positive result from a molecular or uh, antigen test? Is it typically best to to quarantine that plant until you know further testing? Uh, is it best to cull the plant immediately? Um, what kind of considerations do you need to take when making those decisions in terms of which virus or viroid you're dealing with or how, how widespread the problem is within your facility, for example? Again, um, what we are getting here in in-house for the testing is um, mostly the, the positive coming is the hop latent. That's again, uh, that one is um, dominant, dominant for last year. Um, few months. Um, so that's um, that's one of the dominating ones. So that's, we are working on it um, and we are mostly successful about this cleaning this uh, virus. The recent one is the TMV. I don't know the effect or how much um, it's affect the crops, but again, we are working on to a clinic. In many stem culture is one of the things that is not cleaning one. Uh, it should clean um, any virus or virus presence in the in the uh, plants. It's like our technology is a little bit a um, uh, combination of few different things so which actually can uh, guarantee the cleaning um, any other uh, pathogenic and non-pathogenic uh, virus or virus, right? So, um, and we do, we just not doing one time, it's repeatedly uh, keep doing every two, three years. So that that's actually um, give us a good, um, good, um, steps towards the cleaning the, um, the pathogens or the virus and virus. The prevention is, we have to take the prevention very seriously, especially when they are out for stage four uh, facility. So again, as I mentioned before, stage four is cleanliness, uh, the um, absence of virus and no uh, positive cultivars around. That's the um, major thing. So now you have an infected plants outside of your facility and virus, uh, um, they can't fly, so they have to carry. So they, uh, they, the, any insect, aphids, or 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 um, or mites or trips coming from out outside of the facility, which already got infected, um, uh, the uh, got the virus or virus come to your facility, that that will infect um, you, your facility. So that's the prevention is really really important for growing plants, uh, growing cannabis plants, or growing any other plants. And in, in terms of if you were to find an infected plant, what's the what's the protocol in place in terms of quarantine or uh, yeah. is it just so, a matter of just calling the plant immediately? Or uh, so if I go back to the agriculture industry, what they do, uh, I know in the cannabis industry we are so much um, scared of virus, viroids, and uh, pathogens, and everything. But agriculture industry is now living with those. They they do the precaution uh, as much as you can do, especially the three months crop. Um, you grow, if there is no symptom, you have no sign or, um, you, you isolate those plants, you can actually continue to, to grow um, and then harvest it. That's how they, they do um, in their, their side, right? So we try to live with those, but give the prevention and everything as, possible, as much as possible. Some of these like hop later, may cause serious damage, we know already. That's probably you can call, but the one has no proven 
proven uh, 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 damage in plants. Um, I don't see the need of course, maybe I'm not the right person to say this, but I don't see the need, need to destroy those plants. I would say live with those um, and then uh, isolate them. Go in separate facility where you don't have any um, uh, plants than any other other plants, so it will not spread to the negative cultivars. And they harvest those rather than destroying. That's my thinking. That's I saw the agriculture industry do. Um, is for especially for annual plants or short living plants. In the long term, yes, the plant is like 10, 15 to like blueberry, 25 years life uh, longevity. So that cases you should start with. Um, virus-free plants um, uh, with the medicine and everything, I mean, they clean the plants and then go there, there right? So some point they decline, if there, if you feel is contaminated, some points you decline, that's you cannot do, you have to call the plants. So it depends on the severity. Basically, if you have severe disease coming and, um, and plants are sick, obviously you, you have no other choice. Um, that's my opinion. Joseph, do you want to maybe comment specifically on um, kind of the approaches taken at different sized facilities? So if you've got a, sure, you know, um, an operation that's 10 plants versus 10,000 plants, what kind yeah. of considerations do you need to take? Um, the things that I really work with people on is three main things on kind of dealing with prevention of infection. And it is quality control, um, tool sanitation, and compartmentalization of the operation. Um, tool sanitation, uh, first and foremost, the prevention of reinfection and the prevention of spreading of diseases is, I think, more than half of the battle. And what's really hard is, in my experience, working with um, many different cannabis growers from hemp, cannabis, industrial, small scale, um, is just many people um, were still and still do today clean their tools with isopropanol. Um, because it's just like around and it's cheap and it's um, uh, good at killing, for instance, like bacteria. Uh, viroids are insensitive to alcohol. So that was kind of changing over tool sanitation to things like bleach or Vercon S, other types of oxidizers. Um, that was like a huge thing that I work with people. Um, a lot of times it means increasing tool budgets so that you can have the correct amount of contact time of soaking your tools in between it. Um, the next thing is kind of quality control. Like uh, I, I kind of work on this and I try to promote this idea. Many people have different versions of this and I'm like, there's three kinds of plants. There's a great plant, a good plant and a not good enough plant. Um, and not good enough plants are removed in some kind of way. Is it an immediate burn or bag? Uh, if it, you know, if it looks really bad, possibly, but you know, you kind of can have this on deck. We're cycling these things out. The last part is quality control. As far as like met, uh, an extension of that is kind of plant tracking. So a, a large part of, I think, tracking healthy versus potentially infected and also verified, tested negative plants, tracking them and their progeny is really useful. This is like, when I mentioned earlier in the talk, when I talked about like crop instability and crop loss, this was a very common problem in large scale nurseries or basically any kind of operation where clones are taken are, are taken cut from a several, several number of moms of probably a single variety. And then you make trays of clones, you know, um, it could be, you know, 48 trays or depending on rock wool, different, it, whatever's, you know, you make several trays of clones and weird patterns would happen in those trays where maybe a whole tray was lost or a whole tray didn't root. That's kind of how a lot of people started seeing these problems. And then you could kind if you were tracking the moms, you could see that one symptomatic donor mom made two and a half trays or it crossed half of one tray that spilled over into the next tray. So now two trays. These kinds of tracking and labeling systems are one of the more difficult things that I see people try to implement. Um, but those are kinds of the three things, tracking where everything is coming from so you know what's questionable and what's clean, um, which involves usually complicated label inventory systems. Um, tool sanitation, everything is about like it always comes, because that's the failure point that I see. And when I see reinfection happen, it's from lack of following SOPs that are made in a way where it's easy for employees to do the right thing and it's hard for them to do the wrong thing. 
Um, those are kinds of the things that I come down on prevention of infection. Oh, the last thing, compartmentalization. You know, big, large nurseries would be amazing if you have another, you know, greenhouse. Um, cannabis growers historically are amazing tent growers. So I've seen people grow, build phys physical quarantine rooms. And I've also worked with many people that just start throw throwing up tents, you know, six by sixes or, you know, any kind of size tent where you can compartmentalize it, prevent cross-contamination of bugs or anything really. And then usually with that is kind of compartmentalization of the tools. If you're not implementing strict, strict, strict tool sanitation um, tools, I see people have success with these cutters live on this table with this one strain and, or the, even this pot. Those, it's, these are the ways that I see people implement these things. One of the tools what we found is really helpful. I know bleach is uh, for the for the tool screening purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. So bleach is the best one, and we always use this. But glass bleach sterilizer with high temperature is one of the best. Of what I found is in, and we implement that one even our stage four uh, pruning and facilities. Um, so before sending clients, we never touch anything uh, with the tools without um, uh, glass bleach sterilizer using um, in that that places. I also didn't want to ignore testing, which uh, yeah, testing is, yeah. Uh, Dr. Zabaya talked about on like the three things that I talked about on that little thing. Testing is of like utmost importance too. Yeah, yeah, that's repeated true. testing. I just um, wanted to add one quick thing there. The original question is, what do you do if you're a cultivator to get a positive test? Uh, if I were a cultivator, uh, I would immediately try to quarantine that source of the of the test sample if, if possible. But something that wasn't touched on here is first, I get a repeat test uh, before I start building quarantine room, confirm you actually have something and it wasn't a false positive, because false positive tests do occur. Some of these tests, uh, and I'm not casting aspersions on anyone here, but uh, tests, you can get false positives. Um, so try to have some certainty what you do before you spend a lot of uh, resources and time chasing a problem that maybe isn't there. A very good point. From something that uh, that Joseph just mentioned, um, and he mentioned it in his introduction as well uh, about pathogen indexing or virus indexing. Um, I was just wondering if you could um, kind of explain what's meant by the term and, and why it's an important part of the remediation process. Sure. Um, pathogen indexing is basically um, an agricultural term of testing a specific crop for a list of economically impactful pathogens. Um, largely, this is kind of, many times this is regional for um, the crop that you're growing. Um, and this is kind of what I'm seeing the cannabis industry build because it isn't just one thing that many people test for. And this, you know, when you label in a lot of molecular diagnostics, you can also add in testing. Um, many indoor growers, they, fa they fold in fusarium, botrytis, powdery mildew testing um, on this. Um, this uh, so yeah, so this is kind of these packages that um, I see a lot of people send samples out to, you know, testing labs and they won't, you know, they'll be like, oh, for cannabis we request or we, um, we, uh, we suggested this um, panel. Um, if you're growing in this region, indoor, outdoor, we had said earlier, kind of beet curly top is an outdoor, um, largely an outdoor hemp issue. So um, kind of as far, that's uh, like, we're not constantly just testing for every possible thing, every possible time, because testing, diagnostic testing is expensive. So pathogen indexing is kind of this term on focusing in on the economically impactful list of pathogens that you're doing diagnostics on. Yeah, thanks for kind of expanding on that a little bit. I think that's an important part of the of the process. Just kind of loop back to uh, the question of detection and, and testing methodologies. Um, John, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the, um, the types of techniques and tools that can be used on site, kind of rapid tests that are available. And I, I touched on a couple of them, either the uh, immunostrips or lamp type uh, assays for, for DNA or RNA. Um, how those compare to molecular diagnostic tests that could be done in a laboratory? What other what other techniques and tools might be used and useful for testing for viruses? Sure, I'll try. So the, the first things are the rapid immuno tests, so things, things like the strep tests. And 
every test is unique, but as a general class, that sort of assay, uh, they're relatively cheap. They are fast, 15, 20 minutes. They're easy to perform on site by anybody in your lab. There's a, there's a simple direct protocol with them. It is important that you follow the protocol in particular things like incubation time. Uh, do not very often. If it says incubate that for 20 minutes, don't leave it for 40 minutes because you're going to get false positives. And don't leave it for five minutes because you're going to get false negatives. The issue with those kind of tests uh, tends to be that their analytical sensitivity, their raw number sensitivity to, to viral copy number, viral titer in the sample, tends to be fairly low. They are not incredibly sensitive tests from an analytical standpoint. Why am I stressing analytical? Uh, because analytical versus uh, pathological sensitivity are different. If you have clearly diseased tissue, uh, the titer, the pathogen titers are usually quite high and immunostrep type tests can have very good sensitivity. Um, that's saying whether there's actually something there. But if you have a diseased plant and you pick something uh, distal on the plant that, that doesn't look pathogenically infected, yeah, you pretty good chance you might get a negative result there. So it's it's important to use uh, overtly diseased tissue when you use those kind of tests. But on a speed, simplicity, uh, cost effectiveness, they're, they're a very good class of test. They also have relatively low problems with everything we're discussing here. It's an RNA-based organism. They have extremely high mutational rates uh, for technical reasons having to do with a lack of proofreading in their replicase enzymes. So they, they mutate very quickly. And molecular-based tests, this endpoint and uh, real-time PCR methods I'll touch on in, in a second, uh, all of those are susceptible to essentially going blind to a pathogen if it has sequence variations. The antigen-based tests uh, are, tend to be much less susceptible to that because they look at a protein epitope and you need much more changes at the nucleotide level to make that epitope unrecognizable. So they tend to have uh, less, less chance of, of, of false negatives due to host adaptation in a virus. So that's immunostrips. Uh, I, I like them, but don't, don't, uh, they're not the best for sensitivity, but they're good. Lamp assays, I'll be blunt, I really am not a big favorite of these. So lamp assays are molecular in nature. <clears throat> they, as you pointed out, don't need really fancy equipment. They're isothermal. You need a heat block or a water bath at a controlled temperature. And you visually look at the tube externally either for some sort of intercalating or fluorescent dye, uh, precipitation of orthophosphate, or sometimes they're divalent cation binding dyes like TMB which indicate one and only one thing, that free nucleotides were somehow incorporated into novel nucleic acid strands. The problem is uh, a lamp assay has a minimum of four primers in it, and most of them actually have six primers per target. So the first issue is any sort of off-target amplification creates new, novel nucleic acid, and your reporter, whether it's a fluorescent dye or the orthophosphate, your reporter is triggered by that off-target amplification. In endpoint PCR, to confirm that your product was the correct one, in real time, you either use a sequence-specific probe in things like fluorogenic nucleic assays, say cyber green, or you do a curve analysis, again, confirming that it's the correct product. So there's both an amplification and a confirmation of specificity of amplification in other molecular methods. LAMP does not have that, and they, you can get false positives very easily. Primer, dimers, other things can happen in there. The second issue with LAMP, in particular with dealing with RNA viruses is one of the concerns that I have with a background in molecular testing uh, is sample integrity. RNA is a very unstable molecule, uh, depending on how you handle it, it can, can break down. Uh, for all of the RNA tests that we do, and I think any other legitimate lab, if you're testing for RNA virus, we run either an external or a paired secondary control for a RNA marker in that sample. Is there intact RNA? And if there isn't, it's no point doing the test because it's gonna be negative no matter what. Because lamp assay, lamp assays cannot multiplex, 
And when I've seen these kits, they're, they're always just a single target, one target, one tube. Uh, if you have degraded RNA, you'll never know. You just won't get it. So they have a significant chance of false negative. So uh, I, I'm not a big fan of them. Having said that, uh, you know, any test is as good as a performance in your hands. If you have known positive and known negative samples and you want to try one of these lamp kits and you find in your hands it's a pretty good indicator, um, by all means, consider and use it, but be aware it has significant risks of both positives and negatives. So it's certainly not as good as the more lab-based methods. And the lab-based methods, of course, would be on the antigen side. Uh, ELISA, which uses a similar technology to the immunostrips, activity, um, and you can also get, uh, I hesitate to call it quantitative, but you can get a semi-quantitative readout by the, the reaction density, as opposed to just is there a colloidal gold strip? No. Um, and then, of course, real-time PCR, which has the advantage of uh, it's quantitative, but I want to stress it has to be quantitative against a reference because, you know, if you put a great big chunk of tissue in your sample versus a little tiny chunk, you see more or less virus. There are equal amounts of virus in the end uh, per, per unit tissue. So usually you have some sort of normalizer there, and that goes back to something like this RNA internal control. And you can say, you know, what's the ratio of my viral signal to that control? And you can use that to get an idea of load. And this may particularly be important for some of the latent viruses or viroids. Mm -hmm. Some of these, the end of the day, what you care is that you get a healthy crop out. And if you're going to be, uh, you know, harvesting this crop in a couple of months, some of these things, if they're very low levels, even if they're there, they may not have enough time to amplify and have significant impact by the time you're going to harvest. So, have good control measures so you're not yeah. spreading it to other things, but you may be able to grow that just fine. And a very low titer is a good suggestion. Maybe this is not something to freak out about. Just grow it, harvest it, keep everything clean. Don't, don't go rubbing those plants on the other ones. Um, yeah, so, so a quantitative an analysis allows you to have a little more nuance in your response to the infection. It does. It does. Um, and it's also the sensitivity of traditional, uh, you know, uh, real-time, uh, QPCR, QRT PCR, or, or endpoint, if you want to take the risks of doing endpoint and cross contamination, uh, is also vastly higher than any of the other methods. Uh, it, it's even higher than LAMP. So sensitivity is, is much better, which meaning that if you have a, an asymptomatic plant, you may be able to detect things um, when they're at very low levels. If you can quarantine, that's a good step then, especially if you can confirm it. Um, and of course, if you have a diseased plant, maybe you, know, you took a sample that's a little bit away from the diseased area you're still like more likely to get it than you are with an immunostrip. Yeah, thanks very much, John. I think we're going to move on. There's a list of questions from the audience here that uh, we definitely need to get to. So we're going to transition over to the, the Q&A section. Um, there's a couple of good ones here. Um, this one jumped out. Whoever wants to answer this, um, please feel free. But um, does anyone know anything about co-infection with other pathogens, such as Fusarium, uh, co-infection of, of viruses or viroids with Fusarium? Um, so in a lot of the, I've worked with groups, um, that had kind of, um, bad hop latent viroid infection, and they had a lot of kind of variability of asymptomatic, um, strains versus more symptomatic strains. And one of the things that we saw in a lot more of the symptomatic strains was when we were, uh, cutting open their uh, stems. Uh, and this was kind of coming from lack of rooting, which someone else asked in the chat that I wanted to dovetail on this, was kind of um, that black inner, which I think is more botrytis, um, if I'm remembering correctly, on the specific one that I'm trying, that I'm recalling from several years ago. Um, so a lot of times it was that secondary infection um, potentially of like a weakened hop latent viroid infected plant immune system that was causing um, the dudding. Um, and these places where this was happening had very poor tool sanitation protocols. So it was very likely that things were just getting spread around and more than just hop latent viroid. Um, so uh, that uh, as far as like, I'm working with one testing lab where they're trying to actually do more co-testing um, with that for people that are sending out samples for hop latent viroid um, to see what else is in there. Um, on top of that, uh, from that rooting, um, from the internal structure thing, 
many strains um, in like nursery production systems with like system or like symptomatic hoplite and viroid um, infection. Um, we would, or I've seen rooting go down to, you know, 30, 40% of like total cuttings taken. And on, and that's kind of like industrial scale loss. Um, on smaller scale, um, individual plant mom maintenance, like a single genetic was maintained as a mom. I've seen genetics lost where literally nothing rooted from like, you know, two to four moms of a certain variety. Um, so that is kind of one of the more, that and dudding was how hoplite and viroid was identified as a problem in cannabis. Like obviously dudding, cause you would get plants that were, you know, didn't have any smell or frosting, but the lack of rooting was a huge issue in, um, nursery production systems and many other kind of just like cannabis is largely clonally propagated as far as like how strains are maintained. Um, so, um, rooting is actually can be devastating the loss caused by the lack of rooting i uh, just want to add one point here is that um, i know uh, joseph already explained that but if the plants are infected with virus their immune system they, they are weak plants basically just if it, it's not only cannabis i saw in the blueberry industry strawberry industry same thing they are basically weak the immune system are weak so other pathogens got a chance plants always try to defend themselves like us, we, we defend ourselves, we have immune system, but if the immune system broken, plants, uh, they got infected, they are weak. So other pathogens obviously will try to attack the plants. Um, that's why when you start with the tissue culture plants, they come clean, no virus. That you'll see, we saw repeatedly facility after facility after facility that um, they're basically infected with plants, infected with um, powder mildew. Only plants survive is the tissue culture. Their gene didn't change to defend themselves, but uh, but it's, it's it's the clean plants. Their immune system is uh, is is strong. They, that's how they de uh, prevent the infection, right? So that, that's how that's how I would say that yes, if they have a virus or virus, um, plants are weak. They will be obviously infected with any other pathogen. Also, lastly, to add on that is many times when I. Um have intaken plants uh, into tissue culture, even with like the topical uh, sterilization, um, many times, especially from hoplane viroid or other quote unquote sick, quote unquote infected plants, many times those plants uh, will be side by side mare stem initiated with nodal, um, just, you know, sticks in tissue culture media. And what I observe and many other groups observe a lot um, is that those nodal initiations will have large losses to, due to uh, bacterial contamination from like internal systemic bacterial or fungal contamination. So that level of co-infection uh, or just the fact that many plants do have systemic bacterial or fungal infections, I think isn't very well known in the industry. Um, many people are starting to do like air sampling of like grows uh, facilities. And when you think about it, especially in a lot of production nursery plant faci uh, facilities or even non-nursery where you're defoliating, you have a lot of open wounds on the plants that are just open to the air. So that if you like, this actually dovetails on another thing. If that building has some old history of some something else where there's mold in the walls, for instance, and it was retrofitted into a cannabis grow, that has an impact. If you sow, sow an outdoor field that was growing onions in it for the last 20 years, you may be you may be exposed to certain environmental things like bacteria, fungus, um, viruses that infect local other crops or plants. These kinds of things are all things to be kind of being pay, uh, aware of. I'm not saying you have to be insane about mitigation. I'm not saying everything has to be a clean room or that you need to ha um, have the most, you know, ISO seven or uh, lower uh, uh, air ratings. It's not like that. It's just kind of being aware of where you're growing and what kind of environmental impacts you have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, and that allows you to tailor your. Um your prevention methods and the testing methods that you put in place, you know, you're, you're testing for, for the specific things that you might expect to find in the environment that you're growing. There's a lot of other good questions here. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on. And um, 
ask about seed transmission. So particularly for HLVD, um, there's uh, some debate, it seems, whether that viroid is transmitted through seed or not, or whether it can. Just wondering if, uh, if you can comment on that as well. I, my understanding is there have been a couple of confirmed cases, but it looks to me like it's low prevalent, all cases, but it, from what I have read, uh, it does appear to have been documented in a couple of cases, but it's not necessarily high level. And I think maybe that explains why there seems to be uh, some differences of opinion here, but I don't have any firsthand data. We've had um, now two different clients, um, and interestingly, in you know, two different countries in the world, um, that you know, new LPs starting their operations uh, directly from seed, brand new facilities, uh, hoplite and viroid, you know, right off the bat coming out of the, uh, the young seedlings. So, you know, we do see evidence of that, absolutely. I'm not aware of any studies yet on the topic, but um, we've seen some very credible reports of that. Okay, so this one's, this one's one that interests me, so I'll, I'll choose that one. Um, but um, since HLVD doesn't seem to encode any proteins, uh, what is known about the mechanism of pathogenicity, uh, short interfering RNA effects, for example, or siRNA? Uh, it seems like a critical bit of information, but um, what's, what's actually known on the subject in terms of how that viroid infects plants and causes disease? I think the, uh, the, the siRNA dicer pathway does not have good evidence of being impacted by these. They're too long. They're not the you know, 21 base pair long pairing fragment of uh, microRNA that you need to see to trigger those pathways. A lot of these hoplite and viral differences is uh, just under 250 base pairs and it's circular uh, and it has internal homology regions. So it tends to fold up on itself. So it's not really likely to be doing that. So what is the, uh, what's the mechanism of pathogenesis? Partly, um, I think just through sequestration and use of resources. So these things can start replicating very rapidly. Uh, hoplite and viroid in hops goes up to around 250 million copies per milligram of tissue. And that's a lot of uh, nucleotides and uh, you know, other cellular resources getting diverted away to hoplite and viroid RNA instead of making useful uh, rRNAs and mRNAs inside the cell. So the cell is just starving for resources in part. Um, it's a very obvious means. There may be other more direct uh, interactions, um, but I, I don't think it's the uh, siRNA or dicer pathway. Yeah, um, going off of that, um, I've done um, I've done a fair amount of hoplite and viroid specific um, uh, molecular diagnostics. And one thing, an interesting thing that I've seen rarely, not all the time, is when I've ran gels um, of like a quantitative PCR product, I've seen the latter of like that rolling circle replication actually happening from like, you know, the doublet or triplet. So you see that, you know, the primers can pair on a longer than one iteration molecule and make a longer PCR product. And that's kind of like loosely correlated with more asymptomatic plants, which totally agrees um, with what John was saying about like just stealing resources, um, right? Just stealing resources for replication, stealing nucleotides, um, specifically certain microRNAs, siRNA pathways. Um, I agree with him as well. It's like, it's not real. It's the secondary structure of viroids don't really um, lend to some of that. But one thing that I do, two ideas that I kind of like to kick around that I haven't, uh, are, are this idea of like those longer ladders acting in a more anti-sense binding method, kind of like old school morpholinos or old school siRNAs, but that's less, less, less. Them acting as kind of ribosome sponges is one idea that I also um, as pathogenicity of viroids of just like, again, this idea of sequestering, not just the replication machinery, um, but the translational machinery um, to just gum up the works of normal processes, I think is another idea on pathogenicity of viroids. So I, I would, I would add on to that. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just, just going to say, I, you know, one of the things that we said at the outset here is that some of the things, for instance, let's go back to TMV, things that people said, oh, it's, TMV and then it doesn't seem to be transmissible and it looks like uh, it really looks like more like a nutrient starvation. 
Uh, hop latent viroid is not the best example, but some of these other uh, viruses and viroids, including some viroids, do have you know chlorosis and modeling and things like that, which also does look like nutrient starvation. And again, it suggests that at least part of the mechanism there is it just it's just this, the cells don't have the resources they need to grow effectively. So, you know, you're getting short plants, you're getting weak plants, you're getting weak node junctions because stuff's getting sidelined off into creating viroid instead of making useful cellular component. A few more questions here. Uh, a lot of questions coming in on HLVD. That's kind of the big concern. Um, I'm going to kind of combine these two and see if this works, but um, this one's an interesting one. If, if HLV travels passively through the plant, uh, why do stress events uh, where presumably there's less transpiration cause HLV to spread throughout the plant? Um, say they've detected higher levels of uh, viroid uh, after testing after stress events. And um, uh, what mechanism might allow HLV to suddenly replicate when it's stressed? Sure. No, no, no good, solidly plausible hypothesis. It could be in response to stress, things like heat shock proteins are triggered in the cell. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, transcriptional activity. So you may have an increase in things like uh, RNA polymerase activity, and maybe it just ancillary to that, you get more viroid. But, you know, I, I'm making pseudo plausible things up here. I don't think anybody, I, I certainly don't know an answer to that. I'd be interested if anybody else here has a suggestion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess conversely to that, uh, there's another question that just popped up here saying like, does heat and cold um, treatment work as an eradication method for cannabis? And that seems kind of- um, Yeah, you can eradicate the, the cannabis. cannabis. If, if you heat Same. cannabis a lot, you'll eradicate it. The, the cannabis. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> uh, same the if you freeze it, not, not good. Uh, <laughs> Shema, I'm sure can say more, but there is for hoplite and viroid, there is a very good paper that dealt with this. Uh, hyperthermic treatment caused two things. It did cause about a 30 fold suppression in hoplite levels, but it also caused a messing perspective that kind of made my eyes pop a little bit because now what you're going to get is something that still has a limited amount of viroid. Um, but it may be something that's now going to escape molecular detection. So a little concerning. Uh, you can suppress it in that particular paper. I don't have the reference in front of me here. I could look it up. Uh, in 100% of cases following hyperthermic treatment, about six months later, viroid levels returned to the full 230-ish million mm -hmm. copies per milligram. Right. So it was not long-term successful. But bear in mind, we have a crop here which uh, has a fairly short propagation and life cycle. So it's conceivable that you could do something like that. If you do that right as you bring it in early stage, maybe it gives you a long enough window of opportunity to grow flower and get it out before there's significant impact. So I wouldn't completely rule it out as being of utility, uh, but it doesn't appear, at least in that study, to completely cure things. And certainly meristematic uh, approaches are probably a much better bet. All right. Uh, did you want to touch on that one, Shma? And then I think we're gonna we're gonna pass things back to Ian after that. Yeah, I'm very quickly mentioning that I tried a uh, different way to um, treat the mother plants, but um, I don't know it's complete. It's possible to completely eliminate, as uh, John said. There's always the comeback. Um, other thing, I, what we did along with Meristem before starting the Meristem, we do or or do do some kind of treatment, which actually make the uh, us easier for us to clean the plant. That's how we're really successful so far. Um, and um, that's, we, we, we uh, I don't want to go specifically, but yes, yeah, some of these uh, maybe help, but not completely eliminate. But Meristem is the only way I found is, is possible to eliminate. All right, um, I'll, uh, at that, I'll pass it back to, to Ian just to, uh, to wrap things up here and um, thank the panelists for participating in this discussion. This was Really great to talk with you, thanks. Awesome, thanks a lot, Oliver. All right, well, yeah, we had a whole bunch of questions here that we did not get to uh, address today. So thanks everyone for all of the fantastic questions. And, um, you know, if you've got a burning question still as a follow-up, uh, absolutely be, uh, you know, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, our email address again at Segra is info at segra-intl.com. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we also, we're going to have a number of additional events in our uh, growth talk series here coming out later this year. So please stay tuned on our social media and our website uh, for some more announcements there. Um, and uh, if you have any topics that you'd like to propose uh, for a growth talk, uh, growth talk, we're absolutely open ears for that. So, um, so yeah, I'd like to wrap it up here for today. Um, thanks again, everyone, for taking time out of your day to join us. We really appreciate you. Um, thanks to all the panelists for joining us and their time in putting this together. Grateful to you guys. And yeah, I hope everyone has a great day out there. And uh, we look forward to being in touch with you very soon. So take care. Thanks again.